Hello, and welcome to uh, the final lecture of Module 3. Um, our class is winding down here. I uh, just wanted to remind everybody that uh, for turning in your three essays, all right, the link to do that is on the main page where you see the three modules there. It is right down there at the bottom. Um, please upload your essays there. Uh, remember that everything uh, is due by Sunday at midnight, all right? Um, I've graded a few of the essays. You guys seem to be getting that uh, concept uh, pretty well, and uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're keeping safe. Um, our numbers seem to be pretty decent. We had a bad day two days ago, pretty good day yesterday. Um, I know we're going to be opening up a little bit coming up here, but let's just all try to get this uh, to get this right. Please wear a mask when you go out. All right. Know that your professor is one of the people that's most at risk for this. I'm a type one diabetic, so. If I get this thing, man, it's really going to be bad, okay? So let's try to help each other out, and let's make our push. We are almost done. I know this class is really intense, and I know that I don't lecture over so many things that you read about, and I'm sorry about that, but in this format, um, I really had to pick the things that I lectured on and just move on. So today we are going to talk about the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Now... I want to say off the bat, and I'll talk about it a little bit at the end of this slide presentation, that the movement for civil rights uh, for people of color in this country is a continuous <clears throat> struggle. And I wish I could tell you that that was not so, but it is. All right. Different groups of people are always struggling towards, uh, you know, what Lincoln called a more perfect union. Right. The fact that all people in the United States are supposed to be equal under the law. The fact that our Constitution uh, guarantees this. But the reality of human existence, all right, is that things like the Constitution are great, but we as people have to struggle to make them actually work out in the way that they're supposed to. Now, I would be remiss if I did not point out um, that things that have come to light about what happened down in Georgia tell us that there is still a lot of work to do about civil rights in this country. All right. So there are people who struggle every day. And um, I would encourage you to be involved in that. All right. As a democracy, as a republic, um, we have a responsibility. We are the caretakers of our democracy. And when we allow bad things to happen, we don't speak out about them. Um, we've seen in the past that this only leads to worse things. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now and move on. Now, this presentation, all right, is going to look at a very uh, broad view uh, of the civil rights movement. And... Um, we are actually not going to look very much at the Civil War, all right, or really the abolition movement. I had to cut a little bit off it because otherwise I'd put you guys to sleep and we'd be here for hours. I love talking about that stuff, and uh, hopefully if they let me teach uh, U.S. History 1 again, um, I would love to have you guys in there because it's a fascinating discussion. But we're just going to talk a little bit about the legacy of slavery, and then we're going to move on to the development of the Civil Rights Movement um, and other important factors in it and figures. Okay. Now, slavery has been with the United States since the very first uh, European individuals <coughs> arrived on our shore. All right. From 1619 on, there were slaves here. Uh, slaves came with the British, uh, with the Dutch, with the Spanish. All right, slavery was a common institution in the 17th century, and uh, slavery is intertwined with the founding and the development of our country, and it's really important for us to recognize this. Now, I don't want to just seem all gloom and doom, all right, as you will see, all right, we had to extricate the evils of slavery from our society, and 600,000 people died doing that. <clears throat> but it's important to understand that uh, 
slavery was a part of not only the U.S. South, but of the entire country for a long time. And slavery has a very, very destructive uh, legacy that unfortunately uh, is still with us today. Now in 1793, a man named Eli Whitney invented what's called the cotton gin. And what the cotton gin did was cotton as a plant grows and it has really kind of pokey like seeds and things. And the problem with that is that you grow cotton and then you pick cotton and then you have to pick out all of those little seeds and it takes a long time. The cotton gin is a machine that allows one person to run cotton through the cotton gin and to create a hundred times more cotton per day. So the cotton gin allowed southern planters to produce a hundred times more cotton a day than they were able to and it made cotton picked by slaves incredibly profitable. Now I said that slavery was present in both the North and the South. That is true. Slavery generally naturally atrophies or goes away in the North because the economy of the North, slavery is not that profitable. Um, the North was more into shipping and whaling and production. And the North also had a large influx of immigrants. So the North had a continuous flow of cheap labor and the South did not. The South develops very differently from the North because of the massive amount of slaves that are used there. So again, it's not necessarily that the Northern states um, had some large moral objection to slavery early on. They simply had an economy when it was not particularly profitable to use slaves. Now in 1808, the international slave trade stops but the slave trade within the United States continues. Now, slavery in the United States is particularly brutal. All right, it's particularly dehumanizing. It, uh, in most of the slave states, all right, slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person in terms of making up the bicameral legislative bodies. Um, Slave marriages were not considered valid. Uh, slave children were often sold off. All right, slavery is incredibly brutal. Slavery is incredibly culturally destructive. And again, it's important to understand the legacy of institutional racism that exists in this country. Now, this doesn't mean that every single institution is racist. But it does mean that there are long traditions that we really need to understand. Now, um, slaves were bought and sold, all right? Children taken away from parents, wives taken away from husbands. Um, basically, every bad thing you can imagine about slavery in the United States probably was true. Now, during this time, all right, there was... Uh, as time developed, leading on into the 1850s, leading up to the Civil War, all right, there developed uh, people in the North, known as abolitionists, um, who organized what we call the Underground Railroad, all right, where slaves from the South, all right, using um, secret symbols and hiding in people's houses could make their way to the North. All right, places like the Ohio River formed the boundary between slavery and freedom. South of the Ohio River was slavery, north of it was freedom. Now, we know, of course, all right, that in the 1850s, slavery became an increasingly polarizing issue between north and south. And again, southern slavery was essential to the economy of the United States. 60% of the things that we exported by 1860 were cotton. All right, saying is that cotton is king. Cotton funded the development of the United States. Northern industries, all right, used Southern cotton. And this made the Southern states very powerful. Now, of course, with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, um, the Southern states secede, all right? Um, 
slavery was the main issue of the Civil War. Now, it was not a moral question of slavery per se. It was the question of expansion of slavery. The slave states knew that if they did not expand, they would die. And they wanted to expand further west. Free states did not want that. And eventually we came to blows. Now, 600,000 people die in the Civil War. It's a catastrophic event in US history, and it was largely caused by the conflict over slavery. Now, as we move into the post-Civil War period, a period we know as Reconstruction, um, we get a really uneven kind of situation, all right? Many what we call radical Republicans um, wanted to do hitherto unheard of things in the South, all right? Uh, elect African-American individuals, all right? Give African-American individuals full rights under the Constitution. Now, despite all of their um, best attempts, uh, Reconstruction is a failure, all right? And there's a rise in groups like the Ku Klux Klan that do their best to intimidate, all right, through violence and murder, um, African Americans in the South. And basically, Reconstruction fails. And what happens is that the old planter class, all right, um, the people who basically had been um, in charge of everything before the Civil War, all right, retake the majority of political uh, positions and power in the South. Now, by the turn of the 20th century, all right, we have a series of terrible floods along the Mississippi River Valley. And these all lead to what we call the Great Migration. Now, there are several stages to this, but basically what was happening was that there were jobs and opportunities in northern cities, places like Chicago, Milwaukee, Gary, New York being the Mecca, right? People left the South that was incredibly and increasingly repressive and violent and dangerous and they came to northern cities. Now, northern cities were not perfect. There are a lot of problems up there as well. Um, but this is a radical change in the dynamics and the racial dynamics of the United States. It would not be until the second great migration of the Depression that we saw such a large movement of people from one place to another in the United States. Now, the main place that people always wanted to go, all right, was New York City. And that was because in New York City, there was a place called Harlem. Now, from just after World War I, really until most of the way through the Depression in 1937 or so, we sort of see that as the end, there was something called the Harlem Renaissance. Now, the Harlem Renaissance is this collection of really amazing uh, music and art and writing and visual arts all located in this neighborhood that is still there uh, called Harlem in New York City. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance produced some of the most amazing American music, jazz music, um, amazing fiction, poetry, visual arts. Uh, I could do a whole class just on the Harlem Renaissance and it would be super, super fun. So you should look into that more at your leisure. Now, one of the things about the Harlem Renaissance, all right, is that as African American people were located in one place, as they felt as if they had a place uh, of their own, okay, they began to look out at the United States and began to realize what was very obvious and very prevalent to them, all right, that again, they were not being guaranteed the basic guarantees that the Constitution says, all right, all men are created equal. That was powerfully not true during this time in the United States. Now, as black historians and artists and musicians, all right, created a rich and a wonderful sort of black culture, another movement began, all right, and this movement really doesn't sort of take off until after this period. But the point was, many African-American leaders realized 
that in order to organize fully for civil rights, all right, they needed various kinds of people and professions. All right? And it's during the 1930s that we really begin to see the development and the blossoming of what we today call the traditional black colleges, places like Howard Emory. And the important part about these colleges is that people went there, all right, um, and they got law degrees, they got various different kinds of professional degrees, and it's out of this milieu of education, of study of the law, that we get the birth of things like the NAACP, all right, the National Association for Colored People. Now, the term colored at this time uh, was not, doesn't sound as funny as it does today. Um, but the point was, all right, that beginning as early, all right, as exactly the post-World War II era, the late 40s, all right, we begin to see a class of black professionals that begin to lead legal challenges against segregation. Now, World War II is very important in the development of the American Civil Rights Movement. Uh, African Americans served bravely in the war, all right? For the most part, uh, the United States military was still segregated for most of the war, but people returned to their communities and uh, thought that they had served their country uh, well, and again, deserved to um, be given the fruits of their labor, right? Again, all men are created equal. Now, the America they returned to, all right, was part of something that we call the Jim Crow South, all right? And this comes out of this idea of separate but equal. And especially in the American South, though for most of America this was true, the belief was that uh, African Americans and you know white people um, were so different that they shouldn't mix. Now, white people have always been scared of mixing. There's a long, long tradition of this. <clears throat> and um, this basically constructs a system in the South, all right, in which the better schools, uh, the better bathroom facilities, the better water fountains, the better bus stations were all reserved for Caucasian people. And less good facilities, shoddy facilities, if you will, all right, were reserved for um, non whites. Now, again, this grows out of this new Southern society after the failure of Reconstruction. And we call these the Jim Crow laws, all right? Now, these laws basically were put into place in the South in order to prevent African Americans, all right, from attaining things like political power, uh, home ownership, economic independence and prosperity. Um, and largely, okay, this is an expression of white supremacy. All right, there's no other way to put it. Now, Southern people would argue things like, well, you know, people like to be with their own kind of people. And there were all kind of these, um, you know, silly sort of arguments about it, all right? Um, but really, if you want to cut down to brass tacks, all right, it's about the fact that white people are superior to black people. Now. This may seem grossly unconstitutional, it was, but at first, all right, um, in a court case called Plessy versus Ferguson, all right, um, the Supreme Court basically said, well, as long as the equal part is equal, then separate but equal does not violate someone's constitutional rights. And sure, I guess, but knowing human nature, all right, if a system is designed by one group, if the express order to keep another down, the equal part really isn't going to fly, is it? All right. Now, as we move on past uh, World War II, 
there is a fundamental change in some Americans' visions about race. Um, confronting the Nazis, all right, seeing the terrible things that were done to Jews in the Holocaust. Um, many men and women come back from the war and are slightly less horribly racist. Now, I have to say that very carefully because um, it's, it's an inkling, it's a seed, all right? But we can't be too hard on people. We can be kind of hard on them, but the process of moving towards an idea, all right, that um, black people and white people in terms of the law, in terms of things in the United States, all right, we're guaranteed all of the same rights, um, had to start somewhere. All right, and for a lot of people, it starts after the war with this idea that so many of the things that were wrong with Nazi Germany are also found in the United States, all right? The idea that the Nazis used, it's called eugenics, right? It's about certain kinds of uh, genes are, you know, better, certain kinds of people are better. That stuff's invented in the United States. So we begin to see a very slow, slow movement in the United States away from such a racist attitude, but it is slow and it is painful and it is still there today. I'm sorry to tell you, but it is. Okay, now largely when we talk about the civil rights movement, although I've expressly told you that that is an ongoing issue, we usually talk about the time from 1954 until the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1968. And this was a time in which uh, several important movements and leaders, all right, come to prominence in the United States. And it was a very divided time in the United States, all right? This is the time of um, a real shift within American society. This is sort of the rise of various different kinds of countercultures. Um, it's a real radical time. Now, what was this civil rights movement about? Again, we begin in the 1950s um, with people advocating against uh, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. Um, we also uh, move on, all right, to a broader conversation about various kinds of discrimination, all right? Discrimination in terms of housing, in terms of hiring, uh, discrimination in terms of law enforcement. And not everything in the civil rights movement works out the way that we wish it had. Um, but it's a very important step for the nation, all right? It is a very inflective time in which many people in the United States begin to open their eyes to things that they've seen all the time. We as human beings have an amazing capacity to not see things that we don't want to see. Now, during this time, uh, news media becomes very important. All right. One of the things about segregation and discrimination in the South was that if you lived in the North, you didn't really see it and you didn't really care about it. And as civil rights activists begin to uh, force the issue, um, news media all right, begins to carry that back to your TV. Now, this was a different time, all right? It was a time when there weren't quite as many news outlets. There wasn't really sort of the idea of fake news, right? Um, and Northern people began to see what was going on in the South and to see what was going on in their own cities. Okay, in 1955, uh, a young woman named Rosa Parks, okay, um, gets on to a bus. Now, um, buses in the South were segregated, and it meant that if you were an African-American person sitting in the front of the bus, someone got on, you had to move to the back of the bus. Now, Rosa Parks gets on, sits in the front of the bus, someone asks her to leave, and she refuses to. She is arrested. All right. And this begins uh, a national campaign um, joined by people like Martin Luther King, 
joined by many student groups. All right. Um, to highlight <coughs> um, aspects of segregation that they believe to be morally uh, wrong and unconstitutional. Eventually, in 1956, Martin Luther King organizes a bus boycott. And without the money that African Americans give to the bus system, all right, eventually we have uh, a changing of policies. Now, many in the civil rights movement, especially people who followed Dr. Martin Luther King, who we'll talk about in a moment, all right, believed in the theory of passive nonviolence. All right, Dr. King himself had studied the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. And the point here is that what happens in a movement like this is that you draw public attention to the wrongs committed uh, in the name of racism and discrimination. All right, a nonviolent movement invokes violence from the state, and then other people see what is going on, and you're basically shaming the state into changing its ways. All right, you are basically through your own resistance but non-violent resistance so you protest for example or um, several young african americans go into a woolworths where they had segregated seating and they sit in the white section and ask to get served and they get beat up and they get arrested but there are people there from the news media all right and people begin to see really how jim crow works all right and how dehumanizing it is now, in 1956, um, we have a landmark Supreme Court decision, all right, which is called Brown v. Board of Education. And the point of Brown v. Board, all right, argued by very famous NAACP lawyers and later to be Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, is that separate but equal is not equal. It is fundamentally dehumanizing. And Thurgood Marshall was able to show through several uh, kinds of illustrations. He had this terribly sad illustration where this young African-American girl was presented with different kinds of dolls and she wanted to play with the white doll instead of the black doll because in her educational situation she had seen, right, that the white kids got all the better stuff. So in Brown v. Board, the Supreme Court basically says that in terms of education, Black students and white students have to be offered the same opportunities. Now, Brown v. Board is going to prove to be very difficult to enforce. And uh, in 1957, all right, we have the Little Rock Nine, nine students who uh, attempt basically to enroll in an all-white school. Now, in the 50s through the 1960s, Eventually, what's going to happen is that the federal government has to become involved, all right? Southern states do not want to integrate their schools. And as we move forward into the Kennedy administration, the Kennedys are going to become increasingly involved, all right, in eventually using the National Guard, all right, to enforce desegregation of schools, so that a little black girl can go to school. We had to use the National Guard. Now, again, what's happening in the late 50s as we move forward into the 1960s, all right, is that people who are not necessarily advocates or radicals or anything like that are seeing on their daily news, all right, the brutality of the Jim Crow South and the racism of these people laid bare on their televisions. All right, and these are not particularly radical people, but they are average, everyday, not horrible people. And once they see something like that, all right, they're saying, hey, I don't, this is America, that's not right. All right, so you are spurring people who would normally not be involved in such things into involvement in this cause. Now, this was not universal at all. And it caused a great deal of conflict, all right? Conflict within families, uh, conflict between generations, right? Um, societal change is often something that is embraced by the young and not the old. 
So as we begin the 1960s, all right, this is a, a time of terrible conflict within the United States. But for the most part, I believe it was a healthy conflict, all right? Racism is like a cancer under the skin, all right? If it's not confronted and routed out, even though that's painful, it grows and it will kill this republic. And again, I really wish I could tell you it was gone, all right? Um, but... It's not. Again, we saw what happened in Georgia, all right? Unfortunately, the scourge of racism in our country runs very deep. Um, but let's move on, okay, to talk about two of the most important national leaders of this movement. Now, there were many, many local movements, uh, student movements, both in the South and in the North. <laughs> And there were lots and lots of African Americans. There were white people. Um, there was the Chicano movement, right? It advocated for Chicano rights. There was Mexican American civil rights. There was Asian civil rights. All right, the 60s is a period of an explosion of different groups, all right? Basically all advocating for the same thing. Now, the two widest branches of the civil rights movement all right, they locate around Martin Luther King and a man named Malcolm X. Now, what's interesting about these two men, all right, is that they had very different approaches uh, to civil rights and different arcs of their life. Now, by the late 1960s, unfortunately, they are both assassinated. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between them. Now, one of the major events... I'm sure we've all seen pictures of, all right, is the March on Washington in 1963. All right, this was a seminal event in the civil rights movement. All right, Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech here. And this was a time in which lots of different groups, a broader coalition began to become involved in civil rights. Many people within the African-American civil rights community realized that they were going to need to appeal to white people. It's just a basic way to say that, all right? Um, and by 1963, lots of young, college-aged white people uh, are becoming involved in the movement, all right? Religious people are becoming involved in the movement, all right? There is a definite religious aspect to advocating for civil rights. And it's not everybody, right? But... The coalition is broadening because the things that the civil rights movement are demanding are so basic and so essential and so American. All right. Martin Luther King did not get up and talk about Marx and communism um, or Nietzsche or anything like that. All right. He got up and he read from the Constitution, right, from the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. Why isn't that the way that America is? It's the way America should be. So again, by appealing to people's nationalism, by appealing to the things that we learn in civics class, all right, we're pointing to a disparity between the way things should be and the way things are. Now, this is Malcolm X. Now, Malcolm X, uh, as a young man, all right, and the autobiography of Malcolm X is an amazing book. Um, Again, if I do the U.S. 2, uh, we read it. It's, it's a very powerful book. It's very short. It's very easy to read. It talks about Malcolm's life. Um, as a young man, right, uh, Malcolm led sort of a hooligan-like life, a life of crime. Uh, he goes to jail. And in prison, all right, he converts to the nation of Islam. Now, the nation of Islam are the followers of a man named Elijah Muhammad. And the Nation of Islam is an offshoot of traditional Islam that purports something that is known as black nationalism. And Malcolm X believed in organizing, all right, black men and women within the black community. All right, he believed in a clean lifestyle, all right, no alcohol, no drugs. He believed that those things were ruining the black community. And 
Malcolm begins to speak in a relatively sort of slightly more aggressive tone. All right. Malcolm X is known for um, the idea that African-American people need to secure their own rights by any means necessary. And if that means using violence, if that means arming themselves, then so be it. Now, Malcolm X was sort of a very terrifying figure to white people, all right? Um, and that's largely because, as we're going to see, right, he's a great contrast to Martin Luther King. He did not necessarily believe in nonviolence. He did not believe that black people had to follow a certain set of sort of more passive roles than white people had in securing this country. There's a lot of violence there, all right? And if black communities were going to be safe uh, from the kind of institutional racism that they saw all around them, all right, then they were likely going to have to arm themselves and to protect their freedoms, all right? And again, by any means necessary. Now, um, in 1964, um, Malcolm X goes on what's known as the Hajj. All right, now the Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca that all Muslims are supposed to take once in their life. And the point of the Hajj is that everyone dresses in their burial shroud, shaves their head. And the point is that in the eyes of Allah, right, the God that Muslims believe in, all people are equal. Now, this has a profound effect on Malcolm X, all right? Malcolm had really preached sort of black superiority and a kind of segregation, right? The black communities needed to segregate themselves away from white people. After the Hajj, he has a real transformation, all right? He comes back, all right? And he preaches more about things like brotherly love, all right? That if all people are equal, that has to be the way to defeat racism. Now, he also has a conflict with Elijah Muhammad, all right? And the basic conflict with Elijah Muhammad is that Elijah Muhammad had been basically impregnating young women in the nation of Islam and then not taking care of their children financially. He found a great deal of corruption within the nation of Islam. And eventually, in 1965, um, he is assassinated by the nation of Islam. Now, Louis Farrakhan goes on to sort of take his position in the Nation of Islam and drives that group into ever more radical types of positions. So again, um, Malcolm X is a, if you want to call it more radical, more aggressive form of civil rights discourse, right? Um, I have some writings. Uh, there's a link to some of his writings up uh, on the CNM Learn site for this week. So you should look at those. Now, everybody knows Martin Luther King, right? Um, Martin Luther King comes out of Georgia, he goes to the McCormick Seminary and gets his PhD. Um, and Martin Luther King, again, following along in the mold of two different thinkers. One, a German thinker named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was killed by the Nazis after attempting to assassinate Hitler. Bonhoeffer had a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And the basic point of Bonhoeffer's work, which is very similar to Martin Luther King's dissertation, all right, is that if one is going to call oneself a Christian, if one is going to lead a life of Christ, all right, as you are as a preacher, you cannot ignore the things going on around you in society, all right? You cannot say, I am in this world, but not of it, and simply look to heaven and hope to go to heaven when you die. You have a responsibility. You are your brother's keeper. And if that means that you have to go out into the streets and protest and get arrested and get beaten up, then that is your obligation as a follower of Christ. He also read deeply and was deeply influenced by Gandhi's writings on nonviolence. And again, the point and a contrast with Malcolm X is that Martin Luther King, all right, believed in civil disobedience, all right, in marches, protests, um, in going in and trying to integrate places uh, that were not integrated, 
He believed in getting arrested, all right? And the point of all this, again, is that you draw attention to the brutality of a racist system. A racist system has no other way to respond to your peaceful protest than with fire hoses and beating people up. You put that on the TV, all right? And people all over the country watch that, all right? And it forces them to come to terms with the fact that you are either for that kind of treatment of people or you are against it, all right? There is no middle. Now, interesting things about Martin Luther King. Um, we see a lot of people using quotes by Martin Luther King. A few other things. Martin Luther King was avidly against the war in Vietnam. All right. Martin Luther King understood Marx on a profound level. Um, and Martin Luther King was against the war in Vietnam because he said very, very clearly, right, I have no problem with people in Vietnam. And why are we going to send all of our poor young men off to die in some country when their rights are not secured here? Um, one of my favorite Martin Luther King quotes, actually, is that we have, uh, you know, socialism for the rich and rugged individualism for the poor. So Martin Luther King's thought, all right, is informed by a lot of the ideas that we've read in this class. He's a voracious reader and thinker. But he's always a very careful talker when he talks to petrified white America. Right? He knows how to communicate the things that he needs to say. Um, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't understand the deeper critiques of our society. Now, in 1964, he's awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. He is also instrumental in communicating with President Johnson for uh, the passage of many of the civil rights legislations. Now, in 1968, all right, he is assassinated. Um, and his death, all right, along with the death of Bobby Kennedy, makes the late 60s a really rocky period. And one of the things that happens to the civil rights movement in the late 1960s, all right, is we get a lot of anger and violence after his assassination. Uh, where I live in Chicago, where I grew up, all right, there were parts of Chicago that when I was growing up in the 80s were still burned out from the riots that happened in 68 and 69. So the civil rights movement attains a lot of its goals, but it is an ongoing process. Now, in 1965, Martin Luther King and some of his allies organized a protest march. All right, from Selma to Montgomery. And again, along this march and at certain points at it, this bridge that you're looking at right here, all right, police use fire hoses and dogs. They beat people. And this exposes to an audience that otherwise wouldn't have any par view into this the brutality, all right, and the anti American nature of racism in the South. So again, nonviolence is a philosophy, all right, that really says like the state has a monopoly on violence. So if you use violence against the state, the state basically can legitimately lose, use violence against you. But if you use nonviolence against the state and the state responds with violence, all right, everybody sees that. Everybody sees the violent nature of the state and they are forced to come to terms with the fact that that is our state. That's our country doing that. And once people are awoken to this, um, a much smaller percentage of them really want this to be the way that things are. Now, in 1964, we have the passage of the Civil Rights Act. All right. Um, and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Now, these explicitly... Um, forbid discrimination in voting and education and other public facilities, all right? This is sort of the final death of separate but equal on a legal stance. Uh, we're still adjudicating this in 2020. We're still arguing about it, especially the Voting Rights Act. Um, so again, this is one picture of one particularly interesting period in the history of civil rights. 
all right? People are still struggling. People are still fighting. And again, unfortunately, as we saw recently what has happened with, in Georgia, all right, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so I'm going to end just with uh, the introduction. I'm sure you guys have heard of Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter was another sort of resurgence of another generation um, of young African Americans attempting to advocate against the systemic racism of our society. A lot of this, all right, has been inspired by several of these high profile police killings of African Americans. Uh, this particular movement began in 2012, all right, um, after the Zimmerman uh, incident, and is still going today. So I'm ending this class with this just to try to, again, this is an example of the, a lot of the ideas that we've studied here, all right, taken and put into the imperfect nature of our society. And as a republic, as a democracy, all right, we have a terrible responsibility to take care of our own country. And whatever you think politically, um, you know, I always encourage you to be involved, be involved in your community. Uh, your basic C grade is voting. But beyond that, um, you know, we control our own destiny. So we need to do that. All right. Off the soapbox again. Sorry. Uh, so remember, all three of your essays are due by Sunday evening. Uh, all your questions are due by Sunday evening. Um, I will try to be very responsive on the email for the rest of this week if you guys have questions. Um, I hope you've liked this class. I know it's crazy and fast. I try to warn you guys about that. It goes so fast. And uh, so good luck. And I will see you on the other side.